This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. This is podcast number 137. It is the 2nd of October. We're now, yes, we've arrived. Time to put the heating on, <laughs> ladies and gents. The cold snap has begun with Hurricane Helen. The storms, we've had lots of rain, flooding everywhere, trains delayed and all the rest of it. But we're still here. Didn't stop us. We're here. We're carrying on. I'm here with my good colleague, Henry Viola here at HC Viola. Please follow his account. And I'm Peter Higgins at Conquest 3. What a couple of weeks it's been. Um, market's been up, down and sideways, but still in a tiny little trading range of 8,200-ish, sub or minus 20, 20 points, and up to 8,400 still. Um, depending on what happens, um, we could have a good last quarter. We may not. But given the fact that September is normally a very, very poor month for the markets, we've not done too bad, not too shabbily. Um, so hopefully October will be stronger than September and will get give us that nice close or a couple of closes above 8,400. Going straight into the markets, FTSE 100 close today at 8,290 uh, plus um, 14 points. It did touch 8,332 um, at intraday high. Um, FTSE all share is at 4,528. That was up a little 2.84 points today. And FTSE aim all share was down 0.34% and um, down two points at 734. The markets have had a bit of a boost um, over the past week and a bit miners and other companies and anything relating to China because of the China stimulus that's been um, pushed through. Um, so that's had a boost for, a, for quite, a, quite a bit of the market. It's given a bit of an uplift, um, much needed. Um, will it continue? I do not know. Um, will the um, stimulus that's been given um, almost in person to individuals in China, will they go out and spend it because they want the consumers to spend? I don't know. And um, will they save it? I don't know. Will they buy shares? Don't know. Will they buy Bitcoin? I don't know. Henry, what do you think they're going to do with that stimulus they've been given straight into the, their pockets? Yeah, you know, I think they're going to go and put it all on red. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think that, uh, I mean, it's nearly $100 billion, I think, they've announced in stimulus. It's an awful lot of money. Um, yeah. And the markets seem to be seeing this as some sort of saving grace for the whole of the Chinese economy, the whole of the market. You know, the property yeah. issues they've got are all suddenly magically going to be fixed. I am a little bit more sceptical, as you may guess from my tone, but mm -hmm. the same thing worked in America, the same thing worked in the UK, the same thing worked in Europe. The central bank comes out with a huge check and things just seem to carry on. So... Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it's upwards and onwards for uh, Chinese markets from here. We can only hope, mate. We can only hope. Um, we, ne we need to see some um, some spending. We'll see what the next numbers are, are coming out of China in the next month and three months' time. But we are in the month of October, ladies and gents. We have got the UK budget of, of, of our pending sort of, you know, Heartbeats are waiting on that um, at the end of October. Um, we've already had the the heating um, costs of energy costs um, going up. I think it was ten percent, wasn't it, Henry, or something daft like that? Oh, it's outrageous. Um, yeah, that that's gone up um, as of the first of October, which is yesterday. So yeah, so incrementally, cost of living's gone up for everybody. Um, so let's see what the budget does. Um, hopefully, um, fingers crossed, there's not a raid on all kinds of stuff to do with the pensions, but that's what the press are saying, the media. Um, hopefully they don't attack the ISA. But, well, let's hope they don't do that, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll keep our fingers crossed um, that um, it's not an annihilation of 
of people that have actually been trying to invest and save and prepare for the future because the whole point of working hard and putting away pension is that you make yourself a little bit more comfortable um, as and when you get to the time where you actually want to stop working for anybody and to look after um, your children or even your elders you know um, if you've got parents that are in the 70s 80s 90s they now need you to look after them you can't do that if you're still working you know full time in your in your 60s and 70s so you know that's the whole point of the pension so let's see what happens over the next couple of weeks Henry have you got any thoughts on the budget by the way I do I mean I, I'm going to be absolutely appalled if they go up the pensions um, I don't mm. mind so much if they start tinkering around with the allowances in terms of the tax relief so I've always yeah. found it peculiar that you give a 40% tax break to the highest earners and a 10% tax break to the lowest earners because you are you get relief on your marginal rate Whereas surely yeah. the people that earn the least need the tax break the most and the people that earn the most need it the least. So if yeah. Rachel Reeves wants to go out and level the tax relief, say put a flat 30% for everybody or wants to reverse them or, you know, that I wouldn't have such an issue with. But certainly if she starts messing around with the tax-free lump sum or the lifetime allowance, trying to bring that back in or changing the amount you can put into it, or taxing them on exit. There's all sorts of silly things that, that the Treasury could try, which I think will be hugely yeah. detrimental to those of us that do save into pensions. And to be honest, by doing so, become less of a burden on society around us because we're not requiring the state to give us low income tax credits in our old age. We're not so reliant on the state pension and housing benefit when we're older because we've saved into a pension. And I think that's got to be taken into account. I certainly hope it's taken into account in any calculations that the Treasury does in the next budget. I sincerely hope so, mate. But um, the thing I'd add on top of that, though, is the situation or the conversation being had by even the London Stock Exchange with their fear of the removal or potential removal of IHT on AIM stocks um, regarding inheritance tax on that. And basically saying, if you do that, That'll be the end of the AIM, AIM market and small caps that are listed um, that have got that sort of um, special designation. Um, so, yeah, so we're very, very interesting. I think there's lots of lobbying. You know, I say lobbying. There's another word for that at the moment. I'm not going to use that word um, going on um, at present. And I think there's going to be lots of conversations had prior to that budget being spoken about and what they're going to do regarding investments, pensions in investments into industry and so on and so forth um it's going to be a, a game changer you know um but well that yeah. i mean that that inheritance tax break to me should leave it alone i mean yeah. I, I i i've seen a rather perverse situation where there are firms out there that are deliberately marketing aim shares for the iht break Absolutely. so you know oh mrs miggins you're 80 wouldn't you like your children to inherit Two million tax free. Put it in these companies, and you won't pay any inheritance yeah. tax, or your children won't. Only trouble is, they're absolutely terrible companies. They lose a load of money, and so instead of giving twenty percent to the treasury when you die, you end up giving twenty percent to the marketing capital losses. You yeah. know yeah. that side of it, I think, is a bit dubious. But I think there is an element of small business ownership, whereby when people die um, and they are small business owners. If a, an inheritance tax liability is incurred at a point of death, the estate doesn't have the capital to pay it. And that's why the inheritance tax relief was put in in the first place. Yep. You know, and that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and so, again, I, I would be hesitant of all the things that the Treasury could take a swing at in the next budget. I'd be minded just to leave well alone with that, to be honest with you. Yeah, we can only hope. But as I always say, you know, regarding keeping things simple, and what makes sense and using common sense and using emotional intelligence we don't always we don't always get that in with politicians do we no sadly not <laughs> so, sadly we'll, not we'll keep, we will keep our fingers crossed mate right Henry we've we've had lots of stuff happening um over the past 12 months it seems if not longer on and off there's been a constant drip drip of negativity and poor news and poor management and mismanagement of um, entities within the REIT space 
uh, specialist investment vehicles and so on and so forth. And we had quite a back back and forth with several individuals on Twitter um, slash X last week um, regarding a certain company that we both held at one stage, um, Digital Infrastructure, DGI9. So it's my suggestion. So anyone that's booing and shouting at the screen um, or listening to the pods and throw it, turning it off and walking away, my apologies. Um, I will have some stocks um, and some funds and some investment um, related entities to talk about later on, which have done far better than DGI9. But the theme today is going to be investment trusts. And we're going to talk about um, the good, the bad, the indifferent and dividend heroes as well. Um, so where do you want to start, Henry? Do you want to get the DGI 9 one out of the way and then yeah, you can calm I mean, yourself down and then com- recompose yourself? <laughs> well, I, I did promise you before we came on the air I would be polite about DGI 9. So apologies oh, to any member of the audience that's hoping I've got a sharpened axe hidden behind my chair. I don't. Um, for those of you that don't know, DGI 9 is the ticker symbol for Digital 9 Infrastructure Trust. It was a trust set up. It IPO'd a couple of years ago, raised a few hundred million. And the idea was they were going to go out and they were going to buy a basket of digital assets or digital infrastructure assets. So we're talking subsea internet cables and telephone masts and fiber optic internet providers and data centers, this sort of technology, the infrastructure that provides the technology in modern society. Sounds like a great investment. I liked it so much. I had it in my top 10 at one stage. I put uh, a fair chunk of the portfolio in. I mean, not a, I think we were about five and a half percent at peak. So um, a fair waiting for me. And unfortunately, they have had catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe for the last it's coming up for two years now, possibly slightly longer. Um, first of all, the investment managers walked away from the business with no warning. There was an RNS one morning, the investment managers have gone. They'll begin a search for a new one. Now, I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe they fell out with someone internally. Maybe it's not a disaster. Then interest rates went up and all of a sudden they couldn't service the debt. They'd taken on a huge amount of debt to buy some of the assets. Um, The cost of that debt went through the roof and the assets weren't generating enough cash flow to service the debt. And all of a sudden you started getting little RNS warnings and little mentions in the quarterly updates and the annual reports about going concern warnings. This is where directors say, actually, although we're solvent right now, we're not sure we still will be in 12 months unless X and Y and Z happens and then we'll be OK. That's a going concern warning, effectively. Still, I thought to myself, well, it should be fine. There's clever people doing clever things. The share price drifted down and down and down. And then it was probably coming up for a year ago. The company announced that it was going to have a continuation vote. And the share price was at such a huge discount to the net asset value that the board had finally listened to shareholders and gone, we are clearly not generating value for you in the operation of this entity, this investment trust. Do you want us to still look after your money for you? And unsurprisingly, we all turned around and went, no, thanks. Give us our checks back, please. (laughs) That was ever so well. you keep, I love the fact you've been saying it so politely, Henry. Keep well, going, mate. It's just yeah. brilliant. brilliant. Um, my, my, my screaming on the tube that morning was uh, less than polite. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, that was nearly a year ago. And since then, we have had an enormous write-down in the net asset value, which is absolutely atrocious. The, the fund manager, the asset manager, investment manager, is paid based on a percentage of the net asset value. So if they say we've got, I don't know, 100 million in in assets under management, we'll charge 1% of that, we'll charge a million pounds a year. Only trouble is, when you write those assets down, you no longer have 100 million, you never did. And they didn't just write it down by 5%, they knocked 70% off the flipping value. But they waited a year to do it. So we've all been happily sitting there whilst this investment manager, triple point, God bless them, happily suck money out of this fund whilst having it gradually drift down in value, whilst gradually trying to sell bits of it off and pay advisors. 
Meanwhile, they've been getting paid on a net asset value that was absolute fiction. Yep. And so far, the only um, real coverage that I've seen has been a what I presume was a fairly well put together presentation by Donald Pond, who I think presented to ShareSock, it might have been. Uh, um, I've seen some gnashing of teeth on Twitter from people like myself going, why on earth is this being allowed to happen? And other than that, not a lot. So uh, I am still holding, but I am not a very happy holder of DGI-9. <laughs> it's, it's an appalling situation, Henry. Um, I, I, I wrote about it extensively on, on Twitter. Um, I've raised my concerns about the um, the update coming out. Um, and I think it was, was it, where are we now? Wednesday, Monday. Monday, it came, it came out after the bell. They delayed it, hadn't they? Yeah. yeah. 20 past five delayed and delayed and delayed and if they hadn't happened on monday it would have been suspended as an entity wouldn't it right yeah it came out at 5 21 i was i was just i don't hold it anymore uh but I, i'll explain what happened with, with my situation in, in a minute but i was fuming i was like how can they know how, no no one else not a lot of people didn't even notice that it was meant to be due out you know on the 30th by by close of play and they managed to put it out at 5 21 this is the this is updating the nav and the value of something which they had previously done themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, how long does it take you to, to revise, check your own homework? Check, double check your own homework. Yeah. To the point that you were that close to having the whole entity su suspended. And if it had got suspended, I suspect it wouldn't have come back. There'd been like another home rate just going off into the ether like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And again, fund managers and everybody else got caught out, out on that one. Um, but yeah, I, I thought, you know what? It was listed, um, very popular, um, exposed to some really, really good sectors, going to be paying me a chunky 8.5% yield, Henry. Yeah. And um, I, I bought in, where are we now? May, um, April. And um, March of 2023 at 76, more than 76 pence and 69 pence. And I went through the absolute ringer of, of all of it. There's a few little signs which I opted to ignore. Yeah, yeah. Put the clown hat on, the dunce hat on here. And I went, nah, you know what? Give them, give them another chance, Pete. You said you got conviction in it. Give it another, give it another three months. Give it another six months, right? So I did. And the share price just ebbed and flowed and came down and came down. Um, eventually, Henry, if you recall, I'm trying to find the tweet now. I put a Teletubbies um, gif out when I yes. exited and I said, I'm out of here and I'm running yep. off into the hills. Yeah. And I took a massive hit selling it out at 20 pence. And I got absolutely lampooned for selling out at 20 pence because, oh, look at him. He's, he's, he's selling out at the bottom. He's, he's he, he hasn't got a Scooby-Doo. Um, and then, you know, I think at that stage they were saying the nav was something like 70 pence, right? Yeah. And I then, when they came out later on, I was saying, if, if, if they carry on with what they're doing, the, the nav is probably going to be nearer to 45 pence the last time yeah. we talked about it um, back in back in, back in in April of this year. And now they're saying the nav is 46 pence, having slashed it. And I don't believe them. I no, don't I believe don't. them, mate. And the well, share, it's, there's also the, to 17 pence. The issue so, they've got is whether they're going to be able to realise that nav because everybody in the world can see that this is on fire right now. You are standing there at market trying to sell your hay bale whilst it's on fire. Whilst it's on fire. And the Good longer analogy. you stand there, you know, the yeah. less hay there is, the more distressed people can see you in. Why is anybody going to buy a burning hay bale exactly? Now, I say all of this as somebody that's still got my shareholding. So maybe I'm the maybe I'm the greater fool, as it were, but uh, that's not the correct use of the term, I know. But you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it's, this is very, very difficult stuff. And it, it, it may well be it is, that it is, you it made is, the right call at stuff. 20p. It, it wasn't the right call, mate. I mean, my average was way above that, and I got absolutely spanked on it. But, you know, no one gets it right. And we've got to hold our hands up and say, I own that stock and I've made I made an absolute boohoo of it and I failed with that investment, you know. Um, but as you say, it, it doesn't and shouldn't be a, 
you know, 90% of your portfolio because this thing will happen. Yeah. And you have to be mindful of who the management companies are of these investment trusts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because some of them are good and some of them are exceptional and some of them are not very good. And triple point now, if they come out with anything, you, me, and other people are watching that and going, I'm staying away from that one. You know, because they haven't, true. they haven't, you know, they haven't dressed themselves in any sort of garments that you want to admire, you know? So, yeah, not great, not great at all. Um, so that's that's one example of me getting absolutely spanked and taking a hiding on, on DGI 9. I hope and pray for the uh, shareholders, including yourself, Henry, that something is done um, with regards to the the redress and also um that they actually do something with getting as much of that 46 um point whatever it is pence now hit but at the same time they're using up monies just to market just and sell, market and sell and taking out the salaries yeah. out of that so incrementally every three months it's going to drip 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 well the bit, the bit that gets me and the comment we had just before we came on air i, I will repeat this bit when neil woodford did something very similar with a huge chunk of middle england's money it was all over yeah. everywhere. The FT it was on the front page. There were books written about it. Everybody was up in arms. There were lawsuits. Yeah. People lost their jobs. DGI 9, it's tumbleweed. Tumbleweed. Where Silence. are the good and the great? Silence. I mean, it, it. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm the only person in the country that bought this. Maybe we've got, you know, an investment market and actually I'm the only one in it. I don't know. No, there are th <laughs> there are tens of thousands of people holding DGI nine. Trust me, and there's also institutions, Henry. Well, this is uh, what gets right me because, now. You know, the the people that have spoken to me on Twitter, and I've had some DM, I've had some public, and I've had some private. And thank you for people that have reached out because, you know, it's good to talk about the difficult bits as well as the successes. Absolutely. And yet. We aren't the only ones, like you say. There are fund managers that have bought this that basically seem to be engaged in group navel gazing right now i'd quite like some of them to go and get the pitchforks because they've got lawyers and legal teams where i don't go and get the pitchforks and go and get us our money back please <laughs> absolutely if enough of them have lost money henry i'm sure they'll be out you know uh, campaigning at some point i think unfortunately given you know we're in it was september and now we're in october I think they're preoccupied with what the, where the conversation started in, on, on this podcast with regards to the budget and what does it mean for the whole investment industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite and possibly. Just, you know, D DGI nine is one, you know, zero point five percent or zero point one percent of any portfolio that they've got. So very true. They're, very they're gonna, true. They'll refocus on that when, when, and if the budget is over with, maybe. Yeah, that's an impressive pint pot you got there, mate. You're making me. It is, it is full of water. You'll be pleased to hear. I'm not. Right. Uh... Okie dokie. <laughs> Okie dokie. Right, I'm going to talk about another disaster, ladies and gents, um, that I that I hold in this space, just as lessons, lessons learned. And this is one that I purchased in um, June 2022 and in January 2023. And it is called Life Science REITs. And this, the ticket symbol for this is LABS, um, essentially they're in the um what we call I've got, I've got to get this word right so no one misconstrues what i'm trying to talk about it's um the golden triangle triangle which is the top global life sciences region um in the uk and that what's the triangle it is london cambridge and oxford um and it's been named that because of essentially a cluster of life sciences and healthcare and biopharma and sciences you name it that triangle is where it's meant to be at and i read and did all my reading and that's when all the reads were labor flav and i thought to myself that's got to be that's got to be a that's guaranteed win that is yeah that's na that's nailed on success that is going to be yeah i'm going to get a yield of 9.8 percent and i can sit and wait whilst they fill up their labs with tenants and large entities and lots of biotech and pharma companies are going to go in there and make um, the the re success. Boy, oh boy, was I wrong. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. Boy, oh boy, was I wrong. Well, you, you, and, you, um, you've hit my battleship. 
Skip again here because I've still got this as well. <laughs> Mate, I've, no, I've, I've still got it. I've oh, still have got you still it. got it still as got well? It. It's the one. It's the one in that space that I've kept with a view that the the nav at the moment is. Um, I'll have to find the nav. What is the nav again? Seventy six pence. The last actual nav. Yeah. And it's way uh, down at this, forty something uh, p, isn't it? The share price earlier last earlier last month it was down at thirty one pence. It's currently at forty pence. Um, at some point or other, I'm hoping that they come out with a, a game changing sort of tenant has bought X, Y, and Z. Um, but I've I've kept that one um, because it's still trickling out a little bit of a dividend at the moment. So that's the reason why I've kept it. But my average is way down. Way yeah. down from where the price is, way above. Sorry, where the price is forty p at the minute. Yeah, yeah, my average is way above that, and I've kept that one. I'm not sure if I've kept it half for half. I do this sometimes, where I keep something for a lesson, and I look in. You know when, you know when you open your portfolio, and that uh, that red light comes out. Don't do that again. Or it's like a pie that just hit, yeah. you know, smashes you on the face. <laughs> sometimes I keep things like that in my portfolio to say, yeah, what what were the lessons from that again, Pete? Oh, is that lesson, was it? Have you seen anything you fancy that looks like that? You might well want to stay away from it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but at the moment, I've kept it, Henry. Um, so I'm hoping the labs and the spaces that they've got will will increase in tenants and um, rate increases will you be see, made. To me, I can't see already. how they're making such a mess of it because all the press I read and everybody I speak to is telling me that there is a huge shortage of specialist labs. I mean, I used to work for a quantity Absolutely. surveying practice and you can't get that space years, mate. for love nor money. And yet these guys can't let it out. They've only got occupancy of 80%. Now, I think the problem, they've got two problems. One, again, is the borrowing. Borrowing costs have gone up. They've got a stack of debt. Yep. But also, it's not just laboratory space. And this wasn't something I really appreciated when I first bought the REIT. They've got a chunk of commercial property, i.e. offices. Yes. And what yes. does nobody want to do anymore? Go to the office. Everybody wants to work at home in their pyjamas and stay in bed all day. You know? Exactly. But I, I, I must have misread it because I thought the, the old idea of the, um, the office space was the office space linked to the labs. So it thought, does. Well, if you, you, you're not going to just be in the lab. You're going to go out into your office. You're going to showcase what you're doing. You're going to have people working that are not just in nah. lab suits. You, you, know, nah, so you, you, you stay I'm, at home, you have some popcorn, you go to the lab, you grow Ebola, and then you come back and have some more popcorn. I think that's the plan. <laughs> so, yeah, so I must have read it wrong, mate. But uh, So this is what happened. So it had a bit of a, it's had a bit of a pop since they, they put out their half-year results on the 26th of September. So basically, they were saying um, development and leasing progress underpinning earning growth, earnings growth. Contracted rents for the investment portfolio increased 7.9% to 15 million, 15.1 million from 14 million in 2023, with a further 0.6 million from developments taking total contracted rents to 15.7, which is which is you know a bit of a bit of a uh, an increase, but not much really, given where it's been in the past. Adjusted earnings were up 6.3% to 3.4 million, up from 3.2 million. Adjusted earnings per share up one point, sorry, 11.1% to one pence. And they declared a dividend, which is why I kept it. And full year first um, first interim dividend one pence was declared in line with guidance. Um, portfolio value was basically unchanged, really, uh, not 0.3 million increase. And like for like movement driven by 33 basis points outward of the net equivalent yield and so forth but the interesting thing here uh, for me henry was the fact that it was basically saying as with all of these um labs that despite all of that positivity or some positivity that the epra net tangible asset value had dipped down since september of 20 and december of 23 um to 75 pence something like that going here we go so um loan to value was not too bad at 28.83 and we showed a bit of progress and debt was fully hedged at 4.5 percent i'm thinking mm, that's still that's still a bit high at 4.5 in this current environment but they're doing what they can they're doing what they can henry they're doing what they can but i've kept that one it's a dog uh it's not a recommendation as as with all the, the stocks that i I'm, I'm calling out at the minute in this one uh, it's not a, not i don't know we'll see what the management do in the next 12 months but it's nearer to the door than it is into the um, into the boudoir of my portfolio, should I say? Yeah. 
not going to be up there with AstraZeneca anytime soon, I don't think. <laughs> it's never going to be joining that. No. See, I think that's part of my bias. I was thinking, oh, yeah, you know, even AstraZeneca might. Nah. Anyway. So, yeah, yeah, have you any thoughts on labs, Henry? You say you still hold I, it. I, I still hold it. And I again, I wonder if I'm just. I wonder if he's just wishful thinking. I mean, the thing about property, I once spoke to a chap who used to work for the Chinese Property Fund. Uh, I forget the name of it now. The the Sovereign Wealth Fund, anyway. Um, and what he was saying is the main thing to deal with with property, the thing you have to watch out for is... That, go on. Is it Geico? It, no, Geico's the no. US insurance, car insurance. No, is it pronounced something different then? Okay, no worries, carry on. But um, anyway, you were saying that the, the thing that most investors get wrong with REITs is that there's a property cycle. Interest yes. rates go down, prices go up. Interest rates go up, prices come back down. You have cycles of mm -hmm. maintenance. You know, you build a building, it's brand new, everybody loves it. Ten years later, the roof's falling yeah. in and all the windows are shattered. You've got to repair them all, it costs money, you know. You have these cycles in property. And the thing that most investors get wrong is that they, they sort of buy at the top and sell at the bottom. And so I've always been very determined with my REITs to just buy them and hold them. And if I see something that obviously looks like a dip, which I measure against net asset value, I might top up a REIT. I've got a, a position, I've got a, a portfolio that I want an allocation to REITs within. I want it to form part of that portfolio. And as long as I don't deviate from that percentage too much, I'm not too concerned about what the individual positions do, unless they're yeah. doing a DGI nine and you know giving me a migraine at eight o'clock in the morning. Oh. Don't blame me, mate. I've got to keep looking out. I think it might be Ginkgo. I'm thinking of the other one. It could be Ginkgo. It, it, it's something. Yeah. I'm going to end up saying something horrifically offensive if I start guessing at I'm the name of, of the Chinese I'm thinking, I'm, thinking, so. I'm thinking of Alan P. Yeah, yeah it's it, 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 it it's not the golden gecko fund or whatever, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it might be ginkgo. Might be ginkgo. Um, right. Okie dokie. What I want to do now. Sorry, unless you've got another one to go, haven't you? Because I've just done that. Well, I was but, going yeah. to say if you've got somewhere you wanted to go, I wanted to actually take a step back and just talk about the structure of investment funds for a minute. Yeah, yeah, go, go for it, go for it. So we, 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 we've launched straight into this point got a about... Couple of, yeah, because I've got a couple of positive ones I want to talk about and, and recommend yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, have I, I, I have then as well. Then we can I talk mean, about I... dividend in, dividend heroes so people can do slow and steady. Because I want to reiterate to people that it's, you shouldn't just look at the high dividend yield sort of investment trusts and other entities because that's not always a sure sign of, of health regarding yeah. it. And sometimes the better ones that have been giving you the dividend heroes of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years in some instances, have got a lower dividend yield. But they've been giving you an incremental progressive dividend for 50 odd years. So don't be looking and thinking because someone's talking about a dividend yield of 5, 6, 7, 8 percent that and it's got a discount of 30 percent. That That's it. That's a surefire winner. Because ordinarily it is not. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're spot on. I mean, we'll cover this later in the episode. Um, okay. I mean, the thing I, I, I want to go right back to the beginnings of investment trusts, you know, for those members of the audience that don't actually know what we're talking about here. Um, and investment trusts are actually a UK invention from the research I was doing. They, they started in the UK in the 1800s. The very first investment trust was the Foreign and Colonial Government Trust, which was established in 1868. It's a very old financial structure. Uh, and that investment trust was the first collective investment scheme ever in the world that I can find some sort of record of. I'm sure there were some unofficial ones somewhere. But effectively, the Foreign and Colonial Government Trust Fund um, specialised in buying government bonds, buying and selling government bonds. And it still actually is listed today. It operates today um, as the F&C Investment Trust, changed its name to back in 2018. So it's lasted all this time, you know, 150 plus years. Quite impressive, really. Um, and the shares, you know, that you can find, the F&C Investment Trust, are available today. They're actually at a discount to net, assets, net asset value which is a concept we're going to come back to slightly later in the episode. I do want to touch on this idea of what a net asset value is slightly later on. 
But before we go on to that, you'll have heard us on the show talking about investment trusts, but also mentioning things like mutual funds and also exchange traded funds. And I just wanted to take a minute to talk about the differences between these three vehicles because they are actually slightly different things. Now, all three of them are effectively investment vehicles. They let a group of individuals put their money together into some sort of structure and then go and buy assets, whether they're bonds, their properties, their shares, whatever. But they all do them in a slightly different way. Now, investment trusts, which is the, th the structure that Peter and I are talking about right now, are what's called closed-ended funds, which means that they've got a fixed number of shares in circulation. So if, you know, Peter and Henry Investment Trust lists, we issue 100 shares at a pound each, we've got capital of £100. And those shares are traded on the stock market. If you want to buy a share of Peter and Henry Investment Trust, you've got to go and find someone else that's got one and you've got to buy it off them. You can't come and buy it off us, you've got to go and buy it off them. And that structure fundamentally differs from what's called an open-ended trust, which is closer to what a mutual fund is, where shares are created or redeemed based on demand. So in that instance, if you've got a, I don't know, Peter and Henry mutual fund, you could come to me and Peter and you could say, I want to invest a £1,000 with you. We'd issue another 1,000 shares at a pound each and we'd give them to you. Trouble is, when you want to get your cash back, we've then got to buy the shares back off you. And to do that, we've probably got to go and sell something because we don't have your cash anymore. We've gone and invested it. And this is where the trouble with mutual funds come in. There's an illiquidity issue. If we've gone and built or bought a building, say, we can't sell that tomorrow, but you might want your money tomorrow. So what do we do? Well, we have to sell the building at any price to give you your money back. Whereas you don't have that issue with investment trusts. So by extension, investment trust, you can also get this sort of premium or a discount to what's called the net asset value. And that net asset value is effectively the value of all the assets totaled together um, that the trust owns. So if Peter and I are, let's say we raise £100 million in capital and we go and buy £100 million worth of equities, and tomorrow, those equities have gone up 10%. We've now got £110 million worth of assets. If the share price hasn't moved, if it's still valued at £100 million, i.e. a pound each, you're now sitting on a premium to the net asset value. Likewise, if the value of the assets fall, you're at a discount. And so the idea really behind investment trusts, as I see it, is to try to buy at a discount to net asset value and sell at a premium. And so some of the, the some of the funds I want to talk about this evening, I've gone away and had a look at what causes these these discounts and these premiums. So I thought we could talk a little bit about that, but also why that basic model I've just mentioned of buying at a discount and selling at a premium sometimes doesn't work the way you think it will. Now, does that sound does that sound good? Absolutely perfect, mate. Absolutely perfect. A um, bit of detail. I tend to just do an, an helicopter view over things. So it's good to have that bit of detail about stuff and, and get people to think about what they're buying as well. Because if you take the wrong move, you're in the wrong, in the wrong space, you're going to end up making mistakes. And you shouldn't just look at the yield. You shouldn't just look at the previous performance, but look at what's what's going on macro-wise as well. It's important. Um, and what I was going to have, the conversation I was going to be having a, a bit later on, I can say now, is also consider the um, the companies have the investment trust companies rather than natural investment trust that they are actually selling to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so that's something else to consider as well. Uh, but you mentioned the um, the F and C investment trust, Henry, um, which you can find at with F F C I T. I think is the one you were talking about. Yeah, yeah that's so that the one. is one of the ones that I was I was going to talk about. Yeah, F C I T um, as one of the dividend heroes. Um, and what's a dividend hero is essentially an investments trust which has consistently increased their annual dividends for the past X amount of years, usually 20 years plus. Um, and that has managed to do that for 53 consecutive years. Um, and remarkably, given the growth of, of what the um, the fund, uh, sorry, the investment trust has done, it's currently yielding 1.47%. Um, performance um, of that um, investment trust over the past 12 months is 18.6. 
that's currently outperforming, I think, um, the FTSE 100. Sleepy, sleepy beating um, the FTSE, which is, uh, you know. It's excellent. I mean, it really is. Years, and that, yeah. that longevity of a fund, to me, speaks volumes because you, you've got people you know, like a triple point that set up DGI 9, they go well for two or three years and then they hit a brick wall and we all end up losing a fortune. Yeah. But, yeah. But you can put your money with somebody that's been in the market since 18, what did I say, 1860 something or other? 1868. 1868, 1868 yeah. You know, and okay, admittedly, it's not the same fund manager from 1868 because he'd be absolutely fossilised <laughs> and, you know, so things have moved on, but... The fact that the institution survives speaks volumes as to their mindset. This isn't an investment trust that is shooting for the lights. They're not in the, they're not, you know, they're not in gold mines that have got no gold in. They're not trying to land people on Mars with rockets that can't take off. You know, they're not trying to cure cancer with salt water. It's 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 a proven methodology what they are doing, and it's worked for a very very long time. And that that gives you some certainly would give me some confidence that their approach is, is something worth looking into. Absolutely. Um, the, the, one of the um, investment trusts that I wanted to talk about um, currently holds the record as a dividend um, hero. And this is one that I would um, confidently um, recommend others to research. Um, so I'm going to um, put my head on this and hopefully the thing just stops, stops rolling over and doesn't decline and the record's broken next year and it doesn't manage to get to 58. But it's had 57 years uh, as a dividend year, 57 years of incrementally increasing its dividend. Um, and that particular one is um, called Caledonia Investments, Henry, which I think I've heard, heard of. It. of. Um, cur it currently yields, um, CLDN is the ticker you need to look for. It currently leads um, 2%. Um, performance for one year total returns is 39 which is not um, blowing the doors off or anything like that. But um, essentially, it is it is one of those sort of areas where I think that given what it does, um, investing across the world, um, I'll break the, ge the geography down um, for you guys. So you've got um, USA, 39% of it, UK, 23%, China. Yeah, China, we spoke about earlier with the stimulus and some, some of it across Europe. Industry breakdown, general industries or de general industrials, should I say. Information technology, which for a boring sort of stock, you would not have thought that would be the case, but um, it, it is, it's in that space. Um, consumer discretionary, finance in general, and... Um, other investment um, trusts in that particular space. And the last NAV on that one, um, going back to, sorry, the finals, it showed a total returns in the finals of 7.4%. Um, and unfortunately, um, for the past 12 months, it hasn't done that well. However, um, current discount to NAV, Henry, is a whopping... 37% bizarrely. Um, so we said 3% total, 3.9% total returns. 10, 10 years total returns is 112, which for a sleepy part of your portfolio, every 10 years you can get 112% from it. Wouldn't be too bad a performance, I don't think. So one of the interesting things I found about this, and this is reasons why it, it, it piqued my interest, um, it covers three different investment investment pools and all of them in, um, contributed to growth um, with the investment portfolio delivering a return of 8.9 in the year um, when it last reported, despite foreign exchange in wind, wind, head winds of 39 million. Get me tongue all over this, mate. Sorry. Uh, wouldn't, be a pot, wouldn't be a pot if I didn't, you know, mess a couple of words up, would it? You know, so, um, so yeah. So three investment pools contributed to growth, and that was plus 12% return for public companies, plus 12.3% return on private capital, and plus 2.2% from funds. And what is very interesting here is that they've held and continue to hold two quite significant technology companies. 
um, none other than Microsoft and Oracle they've had in their portfolio for some time, which for meant to be a sleepy little boring sort of entity, um, given the fact that they've got, like I say, um, a good 13% of the portfolio in information technology. That's not bad to have those sort of heavyweights in there. And they've, they've obviously done quite well with them over the long term and bought them early and have kept them. Um, so, yeah, I was quite pleased with seeing that they had that. And the dividend, um, last one that they talked about to carry on the 50, 57 years of incremental growth uh, was increased by 4.5% on this occasion. So if I was to, you know, put my hand on the Bible and say if I wanted to buy one of those uh, and could they carry on doing it from the 57 years, I'm not sure about that. But could they do it for another five, maybe 10? The way that they've managed it and, you know, as custodians of it and stewardship that they've held for 57 years, with it being a dividend hero. I'd, I'd pick that over labs. <laughs> I'd pick that over DGI9. You know what I mean? I'd pick, pick that over most of the ones that are out there that everyone's going, yeah, that's the one to buy. Um, and currently it's got a, it's got a dividend. It's got a, sorry, it's got a discount, um, which is quite chunky in comparison to where the dividend has been historically. So. Well, it's interesting that, that discount, because, you know, the fact that you can buy investment trusts at either a premium or a discount, um, yeah. You know, a discount to the value of the underlying shares is effectively the underlying assets is effectively what you're saying. When we talk about buying a pound for 50p, this is it. Um, yes. It, it's the market saying that, you know, we we recognize the net asset value, but we're going to give you an opportunity to buy the assets at a bargain. And on the flip yeah. side, you know, a premium means that the market's saying, well, if you want these assets, you're going to have to pay more than we we think they're worth. Now, why would anybody do Absolutely. that? To me, there's, you know, these fluctuations, they're not quite just as simple as saying, well, cheap is good and expensive is bad, because, you know, what do you tend to pay more for? You tend to pay more for good quality, you know, good, good quality, quality stuff. Absolutely. And you tend Absolutely. to pay less for poor quality. Now, that's, again, yeah. not always a given, but it is an aspect of investing that you've got to be aware of. I mean, I, I went away and had a look at shares that are on, sorry, investment trusts that are on a huge discount to net asset value. One of the names that popped up, you might not be surprised, is Home REIT. The ticket is H O M E, seventy percent discount to NAV. But Henry, it may never come back, so that NAV is is. is but bear, is, but bear with me. Bear with me, right? Now this has got a portfolio of residential housing stock all over the UK, right? tenants yeah. there's a there's a business there supposedly it's hit a brick wall it's fallen down the brick wall it's lying whimpering in the trash cans at your feet you know do you want to go and buy it well not really you can't because it's suspended it's suspended and why do you think it's been suspended because it is such a hot mess and the thing is if all you do as an investor is go and look at investment trusts and see which ones run a huge discount to net asset value, you're going to end up going and buying all the stuff in the bargain bin that nobody else wants, you know, the suit jacket with an arm ripped off and the tie with a someone's cut with a pair of scissors, you know, the uh, the, the pint pot with a hole in the bottom. Yeah, or it and is literally is a straight jacket and you're going into the home and you're not coming back out because you're just strapped exactly. up like that. Exactly. exactly. So you've got to be careful with this stuff. I mean... You know, I, I was looking at, there was another one that popped up, Oxford Technology Venture Capital Trust. And this is a, well, a venture capital trust effectively goes and takes investors' money and it puts it in unlisted equities. So small startups, speculative businesses, businesses that are going to cure cancer tomorrow, or they're going to invent something that transports us to the moon in 30 seconds, who knows. But venture capital is really, you know, quite the risky end of investing. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea is they take your money, they go and put it in these small businesses, the businesses grow, they then exit their position in the businesses when someone else buys in, and they give you a nice healthy profit back. Yep. Um, only trouble is they've lost 58% of their value over the last 10 years. Wow. Now, that's another one that is trading at a discount to net asset value. And it sounds amazing when you look at what they're, what they're invested in. You know, we're almost buying the Starship Enterprise here. And yet it's done nothing other than destroy value. So that discount and premium concept, be a little bit careful with it. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, 
you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks investing podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code Twin Peaks. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peaks promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. Absolutely. Absolutely, mate. Um, it's, it's one of them that we've got to be mindful of. Um, and I suspect there's going to be more of those um, as this debt situation comes. There's a lag, isn't there, regarding the debt situation. And this refinancing which they're all having well not all um the the poor managed ones are having to refinance aren't they or they're looking at situations where they have to just say you know what um, take a vote as to whether they want to carry on and the share was saying just sh- shut up shut just up just give us our money back please you know, give, us give us our, our money, money back. back if you if you can um so yeah so just be mindful um high dividend yield um high um or large discount to nav Amber flags, amber flags, left, right, and centre. Just to me, anything over about twenty five percent discount to NAV, I'm starting to go. Hang on a minute, what's going yeah, on here? Yeah, got to be careful, you know. And we're and we're sitting there like like the both of us are sitting there with labs going. Why are we still holding that? Why didn't we get rid of it earlier on? You yeah. Know? So yeah, we've got to be mindful. So let's talk about another quality one here, Henry. Um, and you can pull up your data on this one here. So this one gives you, and again, I like my healthcare. I like my pharma, I like my exposure to that sector because of all the different things that are going on in the world. Um, This one um, works and gives investors exposure to pharmaceutical, biotechnology and other related healthcare companies ranging from multinational brands to unquoted companies. And the top five, top six holdings in this particular one are Eli Lilly & Co., Boston Scientific, AstraZeneca, Nova Nordisk, Intuitive Surgical and Merck. What am I talking about? I'm talking. Oh, I want to go into that. I nearly went into the song then. Talk about Mr. Worldwide, but it's that's not the name of the company. Um, it's a song by a certain artist. I'm not going to even go into that. Uh, Worldwide, Worldwide um, Healthcare Trust, Henry. Um, oh, currently yes. priced at three pound forty-seven. Um, ticker WWH. Tiny yield of 0.81 percent. Performance, um, one year's total returns of 12.2%. 10 years total returns, 149.5%. For a little sleeper sitting in your portfolio, Henry. It's not had a very good run since 2020, though. I'm just looking at it now. It's It's actually down. I mean, from the beginning of 2020, it's up. But yeah, since the beginning of 2021, it's not had a great time. It's not a great time. So the so my thinking is, right, given its performance, its annualised CAGR, right, the last two or three years, it's underperformed that annualised CAGR. Yeah? Ah. If the cycle, ah, if the cycle goes back to the norm or the median, Henry, the next three or four or five years could be in line with that ah. CAGR. Ah, past performance yeah. is no so indication I'm, I'm, of future returns. So that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Say it louder. You're under arrest. Um, so yeah. So that's my thinking of it, Henry. Um, and they've had the same management company for the last um, 20, 35 years. And uh, they're called Orbimed Capital. They've been in the, involved um, since 1985, and they know the way around the um, the healthcare um, companies around the world. And essentially, they've grown it into the largest entity, largest healthcare investment firm, yeah, or one of the largest when I last looked. So yeah, um, and it's beaten the 
the FTSE all share over the past 20 years up until the the dip that we've just had in recent months yeah so yeah and it's not uk it's not uk focused and anyway. that, that that's a yeah. very very it's popular got, it's global, investment it's got trust. nice exposure we've seen how nova Dordis has, has done in recent um months and year and um, because of the obesity drugs and all the rest of it that it's involved in so that was one i wanted to skim skim over because i'm conscious of the time but that was what would be another one on a long-term basis, three, five, ten years, at some point or other, there'll be a buying opportunity, you know, with that. If it's not this week, next week, next month, beginning of 2025, that would be another one. I would just go 1%, 1.5, 2% of the portfolio, stick it in there, forget about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. buy it for your, your, your little niece, buy it for your little cousin and just say, here you go. You know. A lot to alone. like in that. Yeah, a lot to like. Yeah. Yeah, so so let's 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 see what happens with that. You know, nice exposure to to play the ish space that's growing. Yeah, it's a sector that's growing. Unlike um, labs. <laughs> okay, what you got? What are you going to go with? Well, actually, I was going to take a bit of a break from the investment trusts theme and talk about the competition. Oh yes, the good so, old Twin Peaks investing podcast competition the challenge the challenge um, i fear there's bad news coming so i'm just going to sit down a bit lower in my chair peter's peter's one. been trying to dodge this one he's been hoping i won't bring it up but uh, he's not going to escape ladies and gentlemen so there's a mad I'm there's gonna... a madness song called and there's a line in the madness song called you're an embarrassment <laughs> go on go on so uh, we 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 had some we had some lovely feedback i should start by saying the last episode uh, we had some absolutely marvellous feedback from the audience on YouTube, on Twitter, on Blue Sky, uh, you know, emails. We we were we were swamped. It was really, really lovely. And one of the comments that came in, somebody asked the question, not only could I run the figures for the month of September, but when I do so, could I also let people know how we're doing in terms of, you know, the hosts performing in the league generally? So... I will start um, by saying that actually, year to date, the Twin Peaks investing audience have had a calamitous year. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you'd all been at the Christmas sherry when you picked these shares, but out of 143 in the competition, 80 of us, well, I say 80 of us, 80 of you, have currently lost money with your picks. So, you know, do better next time, please, ladies and gentlemen. Now, there are still, you know, three months left to go, so things can turn round. But, um, yeah, I think we, we, we've we not had a great cohort performance this year. Now, year to date, um, I will say that in first place, in first place, um, out of Peter and I, anyway, out of Peter and I, uh, I'm pleased to say it's actually me, myself and I. You, wouldn't, you might not believe it, ladies and gentlemen, but... Yours truly, Henry Viola Air, is in a creditable, you know, 38th position with a return of 9.4% year to date. So we're bravo, not doing bravo. Too bad. bravo. Um, positive territory. Positive territory. Unfortunately, Mr. Higgins uh, has had a little bit of a car crash here. He's sliding off screen um somewhat in a similar manner to his portfolio which is down in 98th position i'm afraid with a uh, return you say 98 of negative henry 98, 98. Out that's of got him worse since we last spoke about it oh my gosh um with a, a negative 14.6 percent return ladies and gentlemen so um, i blame, I blame yes. it all on Atlantic lithium mate i blame it all on them You've just not seen what I've done with the formula to calculate your shares. <laughs> oh, dear. You, you've got a mate. penalty a penalty score. But um, top of the board at the moment is DJC uh, at DJC3798680 with a 68.9% return year to date. 68.9. So DJC, you are absolutely storming ahead here. So uh, very well done. There's still lots to play for, but uh, hopefully the rest of the year picks up for um, for those of you that are in the negative. Um, and hopefully I will continue to climb up the rankings and um, you know end somewhere near the top. 
but uh, also I've run the figures for the month of September. Yep. Um, and it was a terrible month, generally speaking, the month of September for our contenders. Out of the you know 143, only 35 had a positive return in September. Just wow. 35, and neither Peter nor I were in those lucky few. We both lost money in the month of September, so not doing too well. In third place, we had Oliver Hale um, at Omaha underscore triple one, um, whose portfolio included Future, uh, Future Publishing, Entain, AstraZeneca, Encilica, and Christie Group, returned 5.7%. In second place, we had Richard at Richard Sunt 76 with a portfolio that included Pan-African Resources, Central Asian Metals, Centimene, Anglo-Asian Mining, and Sarabi Gold. Got all the metals there. But our winner, our winner, with a return of 7.94%, was Kevin S. That's Kevin S. At Kevin S. 434.16. Five eight three. He was a private investor from Scotland with more than 20 years investing, largely utilising funds on an invest and forget basis. If you've tuned in today, Kevin, I hope you're enjoying our episode on investment trusts. But very well done on your 7.94% return for the month of September. Please do get in touch with either Peter or myself and we will get your prize sorted out. Fantastic. What was the stocks that Kevin was holding in his portfolio, Henry? Share with those n- names with us, please, mate. That's Because for- that's quite a low return, uh, isn't it? 7.9 7, 4, 7, 4, 7. for us on a monthly basis. Yes. Uh, we in had a portfolio to, to that included months. HVivo, Eurocell, yep. Neox yep. Group, Hargreaves Lansdowne, and Watchers of yep. Switzerland Group. Okie dokie. And I still think you're bonkers for, you know, talking about that a couple of episodes ago, but there we go. It did 21% last month, so someone made some money on it. Which one? Which stock are you talking about there? Watchers of Switzerland Group. I bought it, mate. I've now bought it. Oh, you bought it as well? I, I bought it now. Well, you've got your 20% last month, so Listen, what do I, I bought know? It now. I, 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 said, I said I'd be keeping an eye on it. I said I'd watch and wait. We'll wait and see. I've now bought. I will declare it. I bought you it. do realise that if I win, if really I beat ha- you in this competition, it, forevermore it will be held over your head. <laughs> no, listen. listen it, it's I've, it, obviously I bought it for myself as a, as a conviction buy. Um, it's not something that's going to turn around in in one month. You know what what it's done in one month. It's going to be one of them while they they either shake things up. Um, people start to buy watches again the china china stimulus might help them a little bit the finding they've got to find other markets um i don't i'm not waiting for anybody to write an article for me to tell me what to buy um not many people are talking about it um unless the share price is going up um and maybe when it gets to five quid or six quid or whatever price it going and the media are jumping on it saying this is a recovery play that's going to be taken over then more people might buy it but I don't need to come out and declare it to everybody and, and write an article about it and ramp it. I do my research, I buy it, um, and then I wait and take the loss. Took the loss on, on DGI 9, took the loss on Labs. I don't get it right all the time. But I'm not ramping and trying to encourage anybody else to buy it, Henry. You know? Yeah. I keep getting asked, oh, Pete, why have you told us what that, what which one there you've bought? Because I don't need to. Yeah? Well, this podcast has been going now for six-odd years, right? Um, two or three stocks every pod. So that's probably 400, maybe 350 stocks I've I've shared as really good research ideas and investment ideas. Do I need to declare every single stock I buy exactly when I buy it so that other people can piggyback on it who don't want to do any research? No. Because the, the minute that you put something out there, it's like, oh, what a load of crap that is. Oh, I can't believe you've gone out and bought that. You're getting off of that my, from me. It doesn't have, to fit your, <laughs> doesn't have to fit your criteria. It's not your money you're putting at risk. It's my money I'm putting at risk, and I get it wrong all the time. So you don't want to know what I'm buying anyway. And when I want to declare it, I will declare it, whether it's a good good idea or a bad idea, whether it's up 10% or down 30%, I will declare it. And there we go. But let's go back and just congratulate Kevin regarding his win. I think that's probably the lowest percentage we've had as a win, because you were saying how bad it was for September. But congratulations anyway. Someone's got to win. Um, and I did money 7.9%. 
<laughs> minus seven point nine percent by the signs of it any month so far. So uh, so there you go. Right. Well done with that, Henry. Do you want to quickly just tell us where we are? Because you had some um, good input as well on the charity, mate. Had a few yes. people coming in making some donations and then we'll just give a couple of stocks more before we go or invest well trust, i should say a huge thank you to the audience because um you know we we've we've again you've you've excelled um in your donations this month we're up to three thousand one hundred and fifty six pounds out of a target of five thousand so we are inching there 63 percent of our target from 71 supporters um including an anonymous 20 pounds from an individual who uh, only appears as anonymous on the page, but who also donated thirty pounds to the Twin Peaks, Twin Peaks Ireland charity by mistake. Fortunately, it has gone to a good cause, and yes, your donation of twenty pounds to the Twin Peaks challenge does very much help. So thank you. We've had uh, ten pounds from Robin. Great cause, lads. Twenty-five pounds plus six pound twenty-five gift aid from peter dodge thanks for the valuable investment principles and supporting a good cause uh 25 pounds from our friend pat chi uh well done henry and pete for not only producing your investing podcast but also choosing a very worthy cause for support this year keep up the good work thank you pat brilliant and brilliant. finally we have had in fact, i say finally we've got two more uh Paul E, that's spelt P-O-R-L, uh, long-time subscriber. Always look forward to listening to the podcast and thoroughly enjoy it when I do. A truly worthwhile cause, and I hope my small donation of £25 helps in some way. It absolutely does, Paul, so thank you very much for your support. Indeed, and finally, you. we have <clears throat> £10 plus £2.50 gift aid from Rootmaster TPI. The podcast that just keeps on giving. Thanks, gents. Thank you very much, Rootmaster, and to all of our donors this month. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, everyone. Thank you for your kindness. Um, obviously, as Henry mentioned in the last pod and mentions occasionally, um, it is going to centre point. Um, we are trying to support um, homelessness regarding young people. Um, one in 34 young people are going to need um, support this winter um, regarding um, becoming homeless for a variety of different reasons. So if you can support us, um, whether it be for £2 or £5 or £10, um, please do go to the Just Giving page. I think Henry's got the the, the name of the URL where they, need to, where they can find it for you to make a donation, and we'd really appreciate that. We've got three months to go-ish. Um, We're in month of October, so we've got November and December, and then we're going to close the book and uh, make our donations to Centre Point. So, if you can make a donation and show some goodwill for the the podcast and its educational content, we really appreciate it. What's the just giving page, Henry? Please, it's uh, www.justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash Twin Pete's Challenge twenty four. That's Twin Pete's Challenge twenty four. Brilliant. Right. I'm quickly going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I've given the, the two um, recommended research ideas already. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about some of the other um, entities that are on the cusp of becoming extended sort of um, dividend heroes. And we've got a few names here that some people will recognize. And, and we'll find a ticket for some of these because I, I haven't got them all. We've mentioned the um, foreign colonial already. We've got um, Caledonia, we've mentioned already, which is 57 years. We've got the Global Smaller Companies Trust, which is on 53 years. Yeah. We've got the the Brunner Investment Trust, the, that's B-U-T. Um, that's done 52 years. That, le that yields 1.7% um, performance over the course of... Um, so year to date is 15.6. That's actually doing having a good year this year, Henry. That may be another one for people to have a good look at. And its performance over one year is 31.6. I think people need to have a look under the bonnet as to why that's performed and done 31.6 over the, the past um, 12 months. 
So that's Brunner Investment Trust, B-U-T, to have a look at. Um, there's J.P. Morgan Claver House, J.C.H. That yields 4.9%, and its performance over the past 12 months is 7.9%. So I just wanted to mention those very, very quickly as other ideas in that space that could do with being investigated. Because if they've managed to um, continue their dividend growth for 50 plus years it's probably worth a merit to investigate maybe a slow maybe stodgy but it's the sort of thing if if other people have been able to manage to sleep at night for 51 years or more maybe you could sleep quite well for 51 weeks or more or two years or three years going forward so that's the reason why i'm suggesting that you don't have to go and buy the ones or invest in the ones that are highly recommended by other investors that i've got a super high high income um, yield on their portfolio. My adage is that if somebody is saying that their portfolio is yielding a significant amount, um, it's because the percentage return on the actual capital, what they invested in there, has reduced accordingly. And that's why it's got up. There's one chap I want to um, mention, um, and it's nothing to do with investment trust. It's to do with, I think it was Judges Scientific that Henry mentioned in the last podcast. Um, and I've, his Alan. name has just gone blank on me. Alan. What's this? Is it Kernow Scrubber? That's the fella, yeah. Right. So I want to give a big shout out to a chap. I think his Twitter handle is um, at Kernow Scrubber or something like that. I'll, I'll it is. It's the links. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's actually held um, Judges Scientific now. Um, and at the last, when he mentioned it to us, it had been a 70 bagger. It had become a 70 bagger, folks. People looking for a double, people looking for 5%, people looking for 10 baggers. It's a 70 bagger for Kernel Scrubber. So you need to follow his account because he's done something or got in there very shrewdly. And that particular entity is now yielding at his initial purchase price 70%, right? Not an investment trust, obviously. It's a company that is held at absolute yonks. And now on the initial purchase price, it's yielding 7%. Judge is scientific quality company, um, one of our better quality companies out there. Uh, management are absolutely stellar, still doing well. Um, keep an eye on that one. Uh, obviously, it's already gone up 70-fold, so there is a caution there. We don't know how long that's going to last, but it might well continue. Um, and just keep an eye out on, on that. I will mention again, because we're now on the 2nd of October, that on the 11th of October... Um, the AIC uh, will be doing their prestigious um, investment company showcase uh, on the 11th of October at 133 Houseditch, London. Got an absolute plethora of stellar fund managers that are going to be um, doing presentations and having conversations and be able to have access to them um, face to face, in person or online uh, for the whole day. Um, I'll be there um moderating chairing a panel um, my one i'm covering is on technology and um, the question being what is the next big thing regarding technology to watch that space um regarding cutting edge technologies set to become commonplace and how can investors profit from it and uh, the panel of experts that will be talking about that are kirsty gibson from bailey gifford us growth tim levine of org mentum fintech and Michael Seidenberg of Alliance Technology. Those are the three I will be um, moderating and trying to get as much out of them as possible to share their wisdoms and knowledge regarding that particular subject um, at five, sorry, at 3 p.m. to, to 3.40 on the 11th of October. So I look forward to seeing you, ladies and gents, there. You can go onto the AIC website and get yourselves a free ticket and just um, fill out the the discount code which is show 24 and i look forward to seeing you there okay henry what do you want to add mate before we close this off i think that is everything for me um the the main thing i want to leave our audience with as a thought um uh, you know we do talk a lot about share picking we talk a lot about portfolio management we talk a lot about the ups and downs of the market we don't tend to talk so much about investment trusts but 
hopefully the sense you've got from today's episode is that um you know investment trusts really can be a very good way of playing the market and benefiting from growth in the market and growing in companies without having to take specific individual stock risk um you know their ability to generate income over years they you know some of them even build cash reserves so peter's talked a little bit about dividend dividend heroes which are companies that increase their dividends year after year after year part of the reason they're able to do this is if they take say 100 pounds in dividends they might only pay out 90 pounds to the shareholders and they keep the other 10 pounds as cash in a reserve and so next year they can afford to pay 91 pounds even if the dividends stay flat and the year after they can afford to pay 92 pounds because they dip into that cash reserve and so the cash reserve fluctuates over the years as dividends go up and down and profits go up and down but over 30 40 50 years things tend to go up and to the right and that that compounding effect over long periods of time really can be very very substantial for investors um and hopefully some of the ideas we've we've talked about on the show today give you calls to go away and and research some of these because there there really are some excellent names you know it's not all disasters like dgi9 there are some fantastic names in space uh and if you are looking for a research sort of platform I can recommend um, the Association of Investment Companies, the AIC.com, who have got a very accessible website, lots of great articles, and even better, a really easy to use tool with all the investment trusts and listed companies on there. And you can search by, by the amount of borrowing they've got. You can search by their total returns over one year, three year, 10 years. You can search by the sector they're in, the country they're in. Lots of different ways of, of analysing the sector, but very, very good tool, and it's available completely for free on the AIC's website. So if you are interested in any of the names we've mentioned today or investment trusts more generally, I can recommend going and having a look. Absolutely, and that website is www.theaic.co.uk. Before we go, I'm going to recommend this brand-new book. My library keeps expanding. Do not tell the wife, anybody. Right. Um, this book, absolutely extraordinary book. Uh, not fully finished it yet. Um, I'm just like, yeah, just, yeah, fantastic book. It is How to Live an Extraordinary Life by Anthony Pomliano. Um, X Forces um, is invested in, started several companies, invested in over 200 companies, is interviewed an enormous number of the wealthiest people around the world. And he's basically written 65 letters, um, inspiring letters to his daughters, uh, to his children, um, regarding um, how to live a better life, basically, um, how to run a business, how to maintain relationships, um, how to do well in life, um, how to maintain good health. Um, so it's not an it's not an investment book per se, but there's so much in here that relates to investing. It is staggering without selling you how to strategize regarding buying stocks, shares, Bitcoin, crypto, whatever. It's got nothing to do with that. But the investing insights in this book are staggering. Yeah. I don't often recommend the book enough, um, but I'm going to recommend that folks get out and buy this one or at least look get, get someone to buy it. Put it on your Christmas list if you, if you want it. And, and hopefully, fingers crossed, if we can run the competition for 2025, I will be asking um, Harriman House, who published this book, to put this into our 15 books of choice that people can win in 2025. So that's a wrap, folks. Henry, thank you ever so much again, mate. You smashed it with the insights regarding all the different minutiae of investment trust funds and all the different aspects of it. I'm hoping that people have found this very, very, very educational. Um, we we'll look forward to hearing your feedback. Um, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say about what Henry um, shared um, and the time he's taken on, on the research he's put together to deliver this pod uh, with me. Um, and let us know what your thoughts are regarding some of the um, investment trusts we spoke about, the good, the bad, the indifferent. You know, I will say what Henry would say. Have you been impacted by DGI9? I want to know about it. Right. Have you been impacted by labs? We want to know about it. 
Um, have you been one of those fortunate ones that have held WWH and worldwide healthcare for the last 25 years and absolutely smashed it? Yeah. Or Caledonia. Let us know. You know, have you never, ever bought a stock and always had investment trust? Let us know. We want to hear about it. OK, folks, that is it. Have a fantastic weekend. Stay dry. Check the roads before you go out because there's been flooding everywhere. <laughs> and if you don't have to go out, put the eating on. Yeah. Just chill out. Put your slippers on. Yeah, get your pipe and slippers. Chill out. Relax. Put your favourite TV programme on. Get a nice scoop of ice cream. Put a dollop of Baileys on it. And relax. Right, ladies and gents. Henry, thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Ladies and gents, take care. God bless. Over and out. That is a wrap for Podcast 137. Bye-bye for now. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Thank you.